and hopefully you're not like this guy right now after the presentation. But I, I'll be more than happy to take any questions right now. Yes, Andrew. Um, well, I think intra workout was a product category that kind of invented itself uh, in terms of people wanting something else to sell. But um, I, to be quite honest, I think intra workout, if you have sufficient protein or amino acid before and sufficient after, I think it's probably overkill, to be honest with you. You'll hear a lot of people say, well, I sip on my branch chains while I work out. Well, I mean, based on the refractory data, that might actually be a bad thing, right? It looks like you want to bolus your, your protein intake. Yes, ma'am. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, I can't tell you anything specifically because I don't know specific off the top of my head, but I do believe I've seen some stuff on particular amino acids helping with wound healing um, after you know some kind of damaging injury, like a like a burn or something like that. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if it did because you are, you know, leucine seems to be sensed in other tissues. Liver senses leucine levels. Brain senses leucine levels. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, skin and, and the dermis. Uh, but, and the other thing is too, is actually when you eat, when you take leucine, um, you're going to get leucine, increased leucine oxidation. When you oxidize leucine, you actually form glutamine. So if you give leucine, typically you will see glutamine go up because it'll flux out of the muscle cell. Because when you... Alanine and glutamine will actually go up typically when you give branch chains because the branch chains to be uh, deaminated in muscle so they can be metabolized by the muscle, they transfer their nitrogen, their ammonia group, onto either um, alpha ketoglutarate or, or um, pyruvate to form either uh, glutamine or alanine. So you, have, you may actually get, you may actually, what I'm trying to get at is uh, it would be hard to pick apart if the leucine was having a direct effect or if it was from the increase in glutamine. But it may very well it may very well have an effect. I wouldn't be surprised. Yes. Can you dig into just the basics of protein degradation? Ooh, man. Uh, <laughs> um, so basically, if you're looking at net anabolism, right? Um, protein synthesis is just one side of the equation, and net protein balance will be synthesis minus degradation, right? Um, we don't have a whole lot of good information on degradation, okay? What we think we know is, I'll give you, I'll tell you what we th I think we know. No, 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 you're fine. I'm not gonna make you stand up, that's fine. This will be quick. So let's say we're talking about three meals per day, right? So, and this is your rate, if you have three meals, this is your rate of muscle protein synthesis. It goes up comes down and then it goes up again and then it comes down and then it goes, oh, I'm running out of space because I'm not good at this. Uh, <laughs> this is what you can tell, I'm not a professor, right? Well, degradation, from what we know, tends to follow synthesis, okay? So when you eat a meal, degradation actually will also go up, but it will be lower than synthesis, okay? So the absolute rate increases, but there's still a net positive balance. When you're fasting, when you're in the post-absorptive state, synthesis goes down and degradation also goes down, but it will be higher than synthesis, okay? And then the same kind of process repeats itself, okay? So your net, you know, it's kind of like that, all right? And so this, this gap here is your, your kind of net. So, you know, here you're in a net positive balance and here you're in a net negative balance and so on and so forth. Um, the theory behind that is that synthesis, degradation follows synthesis because um, as, you synthesize, as you're synthesizing new proteins, there's also going to be more that are misfolded. Um, you're going to be getting rid of some of the old proteins as you put the new ones in, so that's why degradation goes up. Um, typically, the consensus is, and it may just be the protein community burying their heads in the sand because they, don't, because they don't have a good, really good way to measure degradation. The consensus is that 
Synthesis is really the regulatory side of net protein balance, and the degradation just kind of passively follows it. And the only time that degradation is really regulatory is if you've got some sort of extreme condition like cancer or uh, a burn or sepsis or you know something extreme, you know, or maybe like an extreme calorie deficiency, calorie deficit. Um, but the hypothesis right now is that it's, it's the synthesis of the regulatory side. You're welcome. Quick question. So there's a lot of people in the online community that <laughs> say that let me didn't get choke on your water there. <laughs> Careful now. So if, if this is all true about leucine, why can't I just take leucine all day? Why do I even need protein? Good question. Because you still need the substrate. Right. You still need the substrate. And um, and actually the there's been a lot of um, in particular like branch chain products, there have been new branch chain products come out. Traditionally, a branch chain product is two, is two to one to one leucine to isoleucine to valine. There's been now, since leucine has been hot, you know, getting a lot of play, there's been some come out with four to one to one, and then eight to one to one, and then 10 to one to one, and then 12 to one to one, and I'm pretty sure a thousand to one to one is coming soon, you know? Um, so, and people have asked me my opinion on those. And my opinion on those is most of the data that shows any effect with branch chains is with the two to one to one formula. And that's probably because isoleucine and valine, leucine, isoleucine, and valine are metabolized in that ratio. So for every, for the metabolism of every two leucines, you need one isoleucine and one valine. And we've actually shown that if you just give pure leucine, you will actually cause the levels of the other two branch chains in the plasma to fall. So you could, you could, Yes? Because it pulls them off. Right, for, for, for oxidation. So you could conceive that, you know, you could actually short circuit protein synthesis because you're, you, those other two levels are dropping. So that's why I, I tell people, look, there may be a better ratio, maybe three to one to one is better, or four to one to one, but we don't have that data yet. So I recommend if people take a branch chain supplement, I recommend two to one to one. And that's why the other amino acids are still important too. Yeah. Related to you said the ATP actually goes down in the cell. Yeah. Um, so the question I wondered, and maybe just a purely a, a kinetics type issue too, mm -hmm. is that you always have a fair amount of stored energy as fat, but right. your body just in it, almost every process you're exactly, rarely I, does it really want to use that. Yeah. Is it just because it's too slow to help? I think that I think you're looking at a kinetics issue because you're looking at ATP within the muscle. And actually, the reason that Gabe got laughed at when he pre presented the idea of ATP going down the muscles, people said, "Well, ATP doesn't change in muscle because if you exercise, your ATP levels still stay steady until you reach like a total exhaustion of, ex of exhaustion." And what they're failing to recognize there is the hormonal. Uh, aspects uh, that mobilize fatty acids, right? That mobilize fatty acids really quick and deliver them to muscle so you can make ATP, so you maintain that ATP. So it's totally different than kind of an intrinsic uh, difference that happens when you're talking about, you know, this depletion. Now I do think that um, by depleting ATP in muscle, you would probably, your muscle would probably send some sort of signal, I don't know what it would be, to fat tissue to mobilize fat, right? So maybe, you know, you're, you're, getting, you're always getting a trade-off with anabolism and fat burning, right? What maximizes anabolism probably isn't the best thing for fat burning. And what maximizes fat burning isn't probably the best thing for anabolism. So when you're talking about body composition, it's also like trying to walk the tightrope, right? Um, so if you're looking to burn more fat, maybe it's better if you're not get you know, maybe you definitely would want just that branch chain in between as opposed to a carbohydrate, you know, so you have something with a low caloric yield, so you still get some of those fat burning effects. Now I'm just, I'm just tossing out ideas here. There's no data to back that up, but that's just my hypothesis. You also have much lower insulin release too then. Yeah, so yeah, should, yeah. Although some people have you know, said that you know, whey causes a huge, massive release of insulin, which I don't buy. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Because the question that, I, that we always get is that branch and amino acid, a whey protein, does it always make people <laughs> that's, that's using short-term data to prove a long-term theory. Um, <laughs> it was good. We got the wipe off board. I anticipated we might use it. So, so the problem with that theory is that one, if you look at people who consume more protein, 
throughout their life, they're, they're more insulin sensitive. They're not less insulin sensitive. So the, the supposition is, okay, well, look at the end product, right? This is like when people tell me high intensity cardio is catabolic, I'll say, well, let's look at a sprinter and let's look at a marathon runner, okay? I realize there's other factors that go into that, but let's at least look at the end product and see how much, that, how much weight that has. But one of the problems is when you're talking about insulin response, you're talking about a biphasic response in most cases, okay? So if you eat a, a carb-heavy meal, you're gonna have an initial release of stored insulin because it will sense that you've eaten food. Your gut will release things like GLP and all these other factors that tell your pancreas, you just ate whatever stored insulin you got, dump it now because we got glucose coming, okay? And then it starts producing insulin to get rid of the extra glucose. So you'll get like, you know, a sustained response and then eventually it will go down as it clears the glucose, right? With protein or with branch chains, typically only get the first phase of that response. You get the dumping of the stored insulin, okay? You don't get a sustained increase. And that makes sense because um, your body, your digestion is tr telling your pancreas, we got food coming, trigger insulin release, but then there's no sustained production of glucose. You know, there's no sustained glucose. So, and if you think about it, just think about it in terms of play it out in your mind. If you had a sustained production of insulin, Every time you ate whey protein, you would go hypoglycemic, right? Because if you've got sustained insulin pushing glucose levels down, you should go hypoglycemic. But that doesn't happen. So the other thing that people have misinterpreted is they look at, they'll take a measurement there and they'll say, aha, same insulin response. Well, you've got to measure the whole thing, right? You've also got to measure the area under the curve. The other thing... Before you move on, so here, mm -hmm. it increases even with the branch and amino acid, even yes. though it's not the carb. It's a tr but, yes, it's a transient why, increase. But why ingesting protein would also increase the insulin? Uh, probably because, one, you've got signals from the gut telling you that you ate. So as, you know, as your stomach um, em starts emptying food into the duodenum, your, your digestive tract will start releasing. Now, that being said, I'm not a GI expert, but from what I understand, your digestive tract will start releasing things like GLP-1, and that actually signals to the pancreas that you've got food on the way, and you start releasing insulin. Um, leucine actually also seems to have like a direct effect on the pancreas in terms of releasing stored insulin, but not a sustained production. So anything you eat, your insulin will just go up just because you eat something, kind of like a signal. <sighs> Mm, I would guess so. I haven't looked, I haven't studied that research enough to definitively be comfortable saying, you know, I, if you ate, you know, eight ounces of vegetables, would insulin go up? I'm not sure, you know. But um, the other thing that people fail to realize is they'll look at uh, signals like, um, like an IRS-1, which is kind of a, an insulin signal. And they'll see, they'll see the same thing. They'll go, oh, well, in response to leucine, you know, when we measure response, if you give leucine and carbohydrate, look, leucine actually makes it a little bigger if you give leucine. But what they don't look at is a little bit further down the road, we've actually done this in our lab, this response is shorter. Leucine actually truncates the response. So you get a lower area under the curve of actual insulin signaling in the muscle cell. So, yes. Right. But over a period of time, if you give them enough branch chain amino acids and leucine with those kinds of meals over time, that insulin resistance will decrease? Well, we didn't do it with branch chains, but Lehman did a 16 month study with women where he took, he either compared, I think I'm good, Nin. Thank you. <laughs> where, <laughs> until the next question. Where he, where he compared, um, either like the food guide pyramid, 60% you know, calories from carbs and 15% protein and 30% from fat, versus like a zone type diet, like a 30-40-30 like diet. And actually showed that basically he could take people that had metabolic syndrome, you know, basically pre-diabetics, and in, in a, just under a month, 
he made the, the, the blood work look like they didn't even have it. Just by, now the problem is, is that we all know, any trainers in here, I think I see a few, the attrition weight rate on people following a diet is extremely high, right? So if you, but if, when he could get them to follow it, yeah, I mean, it, it significantly decreased their, their insulin and blood glucose levels. Now, at the same levels that you recommended, you know, Yes, so he actually, that was the, fr he actually designed all the meals in that study around that threshold concept. So he made sure that in the 40, 30, a 40, I'm sorry, 30, 40, 30 group, that each one of their meals had at least two grams of leucine to hit that, to hit, to hopefully hit that threshold. Sure. Yep. He was, this man was ahead of his time. He always, when I, I told him, the first day I got into his lab, he said, yeah, we typically think about 10 years ahead in this lab. And I thought it was, he was just beating his chest. And by the time I graduated, I understood, no, he does, they do, we do think 10 years ahead. And sometimes that's a bad thing when you go to try to get papers published because people, you can just tell when they're asking you questions from the paper, they don't even get the concept. So, um, but yeah, he designed, although this was back in 2003 before we'd even shown the mechanism that he designed all those meals around the, th the idea that there was this two gram leucine threshold. It's pretty cool. Yes. So I know there's not an answer to this, but I'm wondering if there's hints in the data. Mm -hmm. So we end up with kind of consistent recommendations, right? 30 to 50 grams of protein yeah. for four hours a day. Is there any hint that more variability ends up being better? So oh, in terms of food intake, like protein sources? Yeah. Ultimately, uh, maybe, maybe it's better to have 90 grams in one meal, 30 in another. Oh, I see what you're saying. Minimum, 60 in another. Long-term changes, mm. anything like that that you see? I've never seen anything to suggest that, that kind of undulating it. Now, I've never seen it directly examined either. Right. But based on what I know about protein synthesis, the response is typically pretty repeated. So, like, uh, for example, we took, um, in that 11-week study, we measured protein synthesis, you know, day one and then day 77, and the response was almost exactly the same. Honestly, there's, what's that? That's the max it's a max has been studied, but I, 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 if you inject me with true serum and ask you to give my personal opinion, I think it's probably higher than that is safe. I mean, uh, Dr. Garlic, who was at University of Illinois, he kind of went digging through the data to see if he could show any protein kind of toxicity effects on the organs and those sorts of things in healthy people. And the only thing he found um, was, a, was in a single amino acid study was there was a case in a hospital where somebody forgot to carry a few decimals and they gave somebody, I think it was like a hundred or a thousand times more methionine than they were supposed to get IV and it killed them. So that was the only toxicity he was able to find. Um, but it looks like in people who already have healthy kidney that it doesn't seem to have an effect or it doesn't seem to have a negative effect. Um, now I'm not ready to say go eat 500 grams of protein and that's gonna be fine for you. Um, and even uh, my friend Peter Fitchin at the University of Illinois, he actually did a study, I think it was phase two renal failure, stage two renal failure, I believe that's where it was, where he actually supplemented people with 25 grams of whey protein isolate, and they actually had better uh, health outcomes than people who weren't getting that extra protein. Yeah, because you're, I wonder if it even makes a difference like how um, hydrated the person is. Oh, I'm sure it does. I'm, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, sure, absolutely. I, I, I do not profess to be a kidney expert, because I'm not. Um, but my understanding of the data is that it's almost more of a total solute load on the kidneys that really makes a difference. Because if you get glucose too high, I mean, that can damage the kidneys too. So um, I think it's more of a total solute load on the kidneys. And uh, yeah, I think protein's kind of gotten a bad rap in terms of that. I think in healthy people, it's pretty safe. Right. Too. So if you don't have enough protein, then your kidney will start shrinking. Yeah, and actually the, there's data that shows that like, you know, I believe, I might butcher this study, but I believe there was a study that showed that they were giving kind of normal protein diets, like 0.8 grams per kilo. So low in terms of what I'm talking about, but normal in terms of the RDA, versus 0.4 grams per kilo, which is what they kind of clinically recommend if you have a kidney problem. And they actually found that the people getting normal were actually better off. And part of that may be because if you have, you know, renal disease, 
you know, part of it is, yes, you're creating a little bit more load on the kidney, but also that kidney is not gonna be able to recover as well if it doesn't have enough protein. So it's a balancing act, which is why uh, branch chain keto acids may be, so, may be so useful for kidney people with kidney disease. So you take the keto acid, which has no nitrogen, and it can recycle some of the nitrogen in your body to form branched amino acids that can have a positive effect on the kidney. There's actually some studies I've seen, that I've, I seem to recall that had a positive effect with branched chain keto acids. I'll just say a quick comment. If you looked in um, GISSN for a last name of Lowry, he did a really good study in free living people, those who are taking in high protein, so protein seekers versus non, and they actually looked at GFR, and that actually went up, but like damage of kidney damage, like via microalbumin, uh, they didn't see any difference. That's probably one of the, at least the better long-term studies. I've yeah, seen. and part, part of the other. Um, I'd have to look again, but I want to say it was at least around a gram per pound of body weight. Somewhere yeah. around there. It was pretty high. Yeah. You had and, a hard time finding people that were exercising a lot, consuming low protein. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and part of the problem is, is a lot of times clinically when we look at labs, we, and we've kind of, turned RDs and nurses into this and then they just read a sheet of paper and they oh my God, your kidneys are failing because your creatinine is high. Yeah. Well, did that person work out yesterday, <laughs> you know? Or did they, I had a friend who is a, is a competitive bodybuilder. He presented to the hospital with, with uh, bad GI distress. He was a, he's a competitive bodybuilder. This guy squats three times a week. Um, I don't know, do you know Connor? Connor oh, yeah. Lavalli? Oh, yeah. So yeah, so he went to the hospital <laughs> and he got there and they, they looked at his creatine uh, it was creatine kinase, and it was high. It was like it was like doubled, I think, it was the normal. They said, "Oh my God, you're in rhabdomyolysis." <laughs> I, uh, his mother called me, and I, I said, "Well, I don't think he's in rhabdo. I'm going to call my friend who's a doctor, but I really don't think so because for those who are familiar, rhabdomyolysis is where you have such massive protein breakdown that your kidneys can't clear it fast enough, and it ends up it ends up shutting down your kidneys." I said, "If you're worried." Go, go have them do a, a kidney filtration test. You know, go have them do a, uh, uh, what is it, a sonogram of the kidneys or ultrasound of the kidneys. Make sure everything's okay. But I, I, I don't think it's rhabdo. <laughs> because somebody who's that trained, who's been training for 10 years, is not going to suddenly get rhabdomyolysis. And sure enough, what it was is he just had a really bad stomach ache. <laughs> so... There you go. But we look at these labs, you know, these labs, and they, oh my goodness, your creatinine's elevated, or your BUN is elevated, or, well, that, I tell people, I'm like, look, if you have, if you have kidney problems, your BUN and creatinine will definitely be, ele be elevated. But just because those are elevated does not mean you did, does no problems. And that's, unfortunately, there's a disconnect there where people don't understand that association doesn't equal causation. Uh -huh. and up and down with the muscle mm -hmm. synthesis. And then you also talk about the protein source, mm -hmm. right? So like, so I know say, what you're getting um, at. The, the reset, <laughs> no, because well, you say that um, the different protein absorbs differently. Yeah. And you need it to refract before it starts to synthesize mm -hmm. again. So if, you know, now in the industry, they say combine whey and soy together. So you mm -hmm. extend the muscle, the, the benefit of it. Right. So, uh, so I would show them that graph and say, okay, well, what mechanism is it extending it by? Because it can't just be the amino acids. Uh, you know, the amino acid availability is not the problem with why protein synthesis falls back down. It's the same thing with the argument with casein. I don't know you guys remember, like every couple of years, it, the whey versus casein battle comes back out, right? And somebody comes out and says whey's better, and somebody comes out and says casein's better. Well, I remember around, I think it was 2001, there was a series of uh, research that was published uh, from a French group, and they showed that the, their conclusion was that casein was better than whey. And I found it really puzzling, because they actually, they said casein was better than whey, but they didn't feed equal amounts of protein. They equalized the leucine content of it, and so casein had, they gave more total casein and they said casein was better. Well, you gave them more total protein. When they actually normalized the protein content, whey was better. And what's further is that a lot of these studies, you have to be careful, a lot of these studies are done with whole body protein synthesis. 
Whole body protein synthesis is much different than muscle protein synthesis. Whole body protein synthesis is way more influenced by the gut and liver turnover than muscle protein turnover. Muscle protein turnover is about 1% per day, or even less, it's very slow. Whereas liver and gut turnover around 30 to 60%, or even, I think some gut tissues turn over like 80% per day. Like your, your GI is completely renewed in three days, you know? So when you're looking at whole body protein synthesis, that is much more influenced by those rates of turnover. So every study looking at muscle, actual muscle protein synthesis shows that whey is without a doubt better than casein. And as far as like adding the soy, I mean, I just don't see how that's gonna help because it's not an amino acid availability problem. And if we go back, oh, I went too far, hang on. Hey, look at soy, it's all the way down there. Uh, and actually soy has some funky stuff with it too. Isoflavones, they do weird stuff, man. Uh, just, just, I will, we haven't published it yet, but um, we started noticing during our long-term experiment, like, man, these soy animals are really small. Like, the biggest, soy, the biggest soy animal was smaller than the smallest whey animal. Like, there wasn't any overlap whatsoever. Um, and they were almost 10% smaller. Uh, yeah, well, here's the thing, they didn't have, here's the thing, they didn't have different levels of body fat. So they didn't have different levels of body fat. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, they have a lot of issues with Yep. Well, and there was even, uh, I believe, uh, a guy from Illinois, just down the hall from us, Helfrich, he published some data that in postmenopausal women that um, soy actually increased the risk of breast cancer. Um, so I always tell people, like, I'm not, I am not, I am, have not decided on soy just yet. Um, cause there's some good things the isoflavones do and there's some really funky stuff they do too. Well, and sure, absolutely, absolutely. You get soy yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, cause you're dealing with concentrated amounts of isoflavones yeah. and those isoflavones are very strong. Because I've had people say, well, I don't eat any soy whatsoever. And it's like, well, there's a difference between a soybean or a small amount of soy lecithin or something like that as an emulsifier. That's totally different than, you know, 25 grams of soy protein isolate. But, you know, what really disturbs me is the people who give soy formula to their babies, you know? I mean, like, like I said, it does some good stuff and it does some weird stuff. And all I know is I don't want to be giving it to my baby thinking, huh, well, uh, all right, kid, you're the, you're the guinea pig. Let's see what happens in 20 years. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it, like I said, there's, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say I don't like soy, but I don't like soy, <laughs> typically. Because you can get, if you get soy high enough, you will get the same response as you get with whey. But the problem is, you get soy high enough, guess what? Now you have really high isoflavone intake. So, you're rolling the dice as to whether or not the outcomes are good or bad with that. So now going back to your comment, how you said, you know, with high amount of soy that can cause the cancer. Mm -hmm. So you think now in the food industry, right, since soy is much cheaper, so people go for high concentration of protein, high concentration of protein, and the manufacturer, what they do is the soy is cheap, okay, I'm putting yep. soy in. Mm -hmm. So maybe with that that's, part, part, that's part of the problem, it's like if you see a lot of like the energy bars and Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I gave I gave a similar talk to this at Experimental Biology a few years ago. Mike, were you there in 2010? Yeah. Remember that room? They were pretty hostile, weren't they? The one where Gabe put the picture of Arnold and Lionel. Yeah. And the whole crowd goes, "Whoa!" We're like, "Yeah!" <laughs> yeah. Like this yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I had, but I had like a whole row of soy people who were. <laughs> That, you know, as soon as I was done with my speech, there's a mic right here and they all just march up and get in line, you know, <laughs> they're ready to go. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like I said, soy does some, there's some good stuff with soy, but there's also some weird stuff. So it's definitely not anything I'm ready to recommend to people as a, you know, consume this every day. And even people who say, look, I'm total vegetarian. I don't eat any animal products. 
I'd say, well, go get some rice protein instead or add, add a free form branch chain amino acid. You know what I mean? Like to your protein, but I wouldn't recommend soy. There's a, a lot of the stuff that you've, let's say, proven but tested. Yeah. Bodybuilders have known anecdotally for years, sure. right? And it's kind of the same thing with soy. Like, you know, yeah. Mahler, he's like your poster boy for vegetarianism. Yeah. He has to do all this crazy hormonal stuff. Yeah. To, to keep things normal. Yeah. You know? So there, well, there's it, evidence there. It was funny. Uh, uh, there's a anybody watches the UFC. There's a there was a fighter named John Fitch, who was very very strong wrestler. Um, went totally vegetarian and was talking about how bad meat is for you and everything and how bad dairy is for you. You could literally watch him shrink over the last five years. <laughs> and his fight record got worse because he wasn't able to bully people around. He was, he was a guy who would take somebody, push him up against the cage and be able to throw him down to the ground eventually. And he couldn't do that by the end of his, by the end of, he's out of the UFC now. He was a guy who went from a title contender to nothing. So I blame it on the vegetarian diet. <laughs> Yeah. They have, uh, pea protein. Yes. So how is that? Is I believe pea protein, protein is like a like eight and a half percent leucine. I think it? it's okay. they say it's high leucine, but it's really kind of middle of the pack. I so mean, it's higher than wheat. And where does it fall? It's higher than wheat. So let's see here. If you compare it to the wheat, soy, and egg, and yeah, we'll go less so. Right in between here, so literally middle of the pack. So it's more than chicken? Uh, I think it's like slightly more than chicken. I'm not sure about this chicken number. I think this is probably closer to eight. I think I, I think that's probably closer to eight. But, um, but yeah, I, I so pea protein probably better than you know um, like a soy or a wheat or, but definitely not as good. I mean, you know, everything's kind of bunched up together in this. And then boom, you have milk, which is a full percent higher than everything else. And then boom, you have whey, which is another full percent higher, you know. Right. Sure. Right. So if it's a true vegan, uh, I've, you know, pea protein, or I would tell them, look, here, take a, to each meal, add, you know, a gram of leucine or something like that. And then you're going to ensure that they're hitting the threshold. So can you get powdered, pure, plain Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or, or, or a branch chain. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I have last question that is not related to this, but you know, I want to know, you, you come out across really passionate and hmm. love what you do. Like, what's the, what's the motivation behind that? Whew, uh, I got picked on a lot as a kid. Oh, I, <laughs> no, um, you know, I just, yeah, I really like what I do. You know, I, I, I've talked to, um, I get a lot of people who message me and I guess they see that too. And they say, you know, I, I want to do what you do or I, you know, I want to do this or how do I do this? You know, I'm worried about having a job. I'm worried about this, you know, and I say, look, you know, job security is kind of the great big myth and the great big lie because um, when I, I actually, a good story is I went, my, the first speech I gave after I was out of graduate school and working for myself, I owned my own company. Um, I was there with a bunch of my academic friends who were, who were now professors and involved with academia. And they said, man, how do you do it? You're so brave. Like, you know, you got to go out and get it on your own. Oh, we get a steady paycheck. I said, yeah, but what happens if the school's funding get cut? What happens if somebody above you screws up? Okay? Your, your ability to make money is only as good as the guy above you, you know, or the person above you. I'm not going to fire me, you know, at least I hope not. <laughs> uh, the only person going to fire me, you know, would be the other person I live with, and I don't think she's going to fire me either. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, I just, I, I, I truly believe that if you love what you do, it comes across, you know, and when I was, you know, at touring DeVisco, one of the things I was impressed with was how much, you know, people were giving the tour knew about it. They knew about the family and they loved the family. And, you know, it was so important to them to do a good job. And uh, so that was kind of cool to see that. And, like, I, I don't know. I'm a big fan of passion. I, th I think that I don't think I'm that much smarter than anybody else. I don't think I'm that much, you know, inherently better than anybody else. Like in terms of like when I do bodybuilding or powerlifting, I was a little scrawny runt kid. I just really, really like what I do, and so it makes it easy to get out of bed and go do it, you know? So I guess that's the long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> um, if there are no more questions, then, you know, 
we would like to say thank you very much for coming here today, and thank you all of you for being here. Um, I learned a lot about leucine now and how it's diff different from other amino acids and the importance of it. So after this, we're going to have a small reception, so please join us for some food and drinks. And so um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.